Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of the Less Invasive Podcast, your source for minimally invasive surgery, robotics, assistive technologies for the operating room and radiology environment. I'm your host, Lucien Blondel, co-founder and CTO of Quantum Surgical, a startup commercializing the Epion robot for percutaneous tumor ablation. I bring to the table 20 years of experience in imaging and robotics for various specialties, neurosurgery, orthopedics, spine surgery, interventional radiology, and interventional uh, oncology. Today, I'm uh, very excited to have Dr. Atul Gupta on the show. Atul is an interventional radiologist with over two decades of uh, clinical experience. He's practicing in the Philadelphia area and is also the global chief medical officer at Philips for the image-guided therapy business. And uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for taking time for me, uh, Atul. Thank you very much, Lucien. And uh, I'm very excited to be here. I, I love your podcast. Thanks. So I, I actually, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I worked on the development of a robotic interventional angiography uh, system. That's where, that's how I discovered the interventional radiology field and image guided therapy. I find this is a very fascinating field that uh, is seeing a lot of innovation for our minimally invasive treatments. But uh, before we talk about Philips and image guided therapy, a couple of questions uh, for the audience to get to uh, know who you are. So can you maybe briefly introduce yourself, what is your background and what has been your journey into uh, IR and up to your current role of uh, CMO at uh, Philips? Yeah, so as you alluded to earlier, I like probably many of your listeners, I'm an interventionalist. So I'm an interventional radiologist by background, and I've been practicing for over two decades here in suburban Philadelphia. I also have dual board certification, so I'm a diagnostic radiologist, the people that read the x-rays and the MRIs and the ultrasounds. But that's not how I started my journey. So I actually started out being and wanting to be a cardiac surgeon. And in fact, I did a year of general surgery very early on in my training. Uh, but I switched to interventional radiology because probably like you, uh, over the last two decades, I've seen a tremendous explosion in this novel field of image-guided therapy, less invasive procedures, novel procedures, miniaturization of medical devices, all coupled with imaging. And it was really magical to me when I was a medical student uh, to be able to see how people were treating um, blocked bile ducts and, and uh, abnormalities in the liver and killing cancers and opening up blocked arteries, and patients would get off the table and go home the same day with just a Band-Aid. And so I thought that was the future. And that's why I made the switch from surgery to interventional radiology. And so I practiced, uh, I've been practicing here for over two decades. Um, I trained at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but then I also very early on in my career um, wanted to help industry. So I, I joined forces a bit with Philips um, because I really was interested in the integration of imaging, integration of CAT scans and MRIs and ultrasounds, 3D guidance, tied to the live procedure, kind of the human GPS. And so I would just do research on the side um, on how these tools can reduce x-ray dose and reduce procedure time, reduce contrast, developing new procedures like fibroid embolization using these tools. Um, and that was the start of my relationship with Philips. And then we formalized that uh, about seven, eight years ago. All right. I think that's a, uh, it's a very interesting story, the switch for, from uh, general surgery to uh, interventional uh, radiology. So uh, is the, uh, along your journey into this, uh, this, um, this way to IR and uh, CMO, is there someone who has been inspiring you and uh, why? Um, as many of your um, radiologist listeners may know, there's a, a figure by the name of Dr. Uh, Stan Cope. Uh, who has uh, since passed away, but he actually was one of my uh, uh, attendings when I was in residency and fellowship. And uh, he was really a great mentor. He's, as many of your audience may know, is an innovator. So what did he do? He invented things that we use today, the micropuncture needle access, gastrostomy tubes, nephrostomy tubes. He created all sorts of procedures to treat the biliary tree, even things like lymphangiography and thoracic duct embolization. Um, and, and he just invented these things at the age of 70 and beyond. And he had super energy. That's why he was such a great person to work with. In fact, um, I used to ask him, you know, what is your background? He wasn't a radiologist. He wasn't an interventional radiologist. He was actually an internal medicine doctor. Uh, but he said, it's, well, it doesn't matter what my specialty is. I'm just a gadgeteer. And at, at, at the core, I think what I am, what you are, what our listeners are, are all gadgeteers. And I think that those of us that perform procedures using image-guided therapy, 
um, we're all gadgeteers and we're, there's a blurring of lines of these specialties. And, and at some point, rather than calling us vascular surgeons and cardiologists and interventional radiologists, I think that at some point in my life, we may just be called image guided therapists. So I found Dr. Cope super inspirational. And maybe the biggest reason I found him inspirational was he was an inventor, but he always would invent things to address a problem, not just throw technology. And all too often I see, even in industry today, a lot of companies create technology just for the purpose of technology, but not to address an unmet need, not to improve outcomes, not to reduce cost, not, you know, we want to improve the patient experience and staff experience. Those are the four things that we want to do. We call the quadruple aim. So I've held that deep inside of me uh, and I bring it to my, my, my work every day. And that's what we do at Philips. That's the heart of what we do is, is that quadruple aim. All right. So you you uh, you were in touch with the innovation since the the very beginning of your of your career. And uh, right now, how do you drive innovation? Uh, what's your CMO role at Philips? How you you push innovation uh, into this uh, big med tech company, and how you make sure that the uh, you the teams are developing a, a technology for unmet need. Yeah. So it's um, a very interesting job because maybe also like my job in. Uh, 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 it, when I was working full-time in, in clinical practice, the variety of things that I do mm -hmm. is great. And that also is what keeps it interesting. You know, in my clinical world, I used to treat uh, patients with difficulty breathing and pulmonary embolisms and thoracic, uh, pleural effusions and fibroid embolizations and tumors and, and trauma patients. And all of this you would do in one day, eight or nine patients a day. So the variety was great. Um, but then coming to Philips was uh, uh, sort of, I could take this exponentially to a, gr a greater level because at Philips, it's, it's our ambition to improve the lives of two and a half billion patients a year. I can only treat eight patients a day in my, my clinical world. And so um, that to me was part of the reason that I came to Philips. And then what do I do here? Um, it's varied, as I said. Um, I'm responsible uh, as part of the management team for the clinical strategy and the vision an image-guided therapy. An image-guided therapy is our business made up of our device businesses, our endovascular device businesses, and also our imaging systems, our interventional suites. And so that means developing new therapies and imaging and tying it together in things like radiology and cardiology and structural heart disease, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, arterial and venous, spine, oncology, neuro, but also thinking about the future of healthcare areas that we want to expand into, not just where the puck is today, but where the puck is headed. And so I give a lot of clinical input into our product roadmap. I work very closely with the innovation teams on the imaging systems and the devices is what makes me most excited. I'm also heavily involved in things like acquisition and due diligence and engaging with external partners, partners, not just for acquisition, but also for alliances because healthcare is too big. No one company I think can do it alone. We have to work together, it's collaboration that leads to the best innovation. Um, and I'm sort of the clinical voice internally. I'm the real world clinical voice because I practiced for over two decades to give a sanity check or guidance on where we need to head. But if you ask me in a nutshell what I really do, it's the same thing that all 70,000 of our employees at Philips do across 100 countries. I get up every single day with the same purpose. I get paid to dream about the future of healthcare. And to me, that's pretty exciting. Okay. Yeah, that sounds a very exciting job. So, to uh, get to the to the future of uh, of um, image guided therapy, I guess maybe do, do you go to uh, other specialties to uh, look at uh, what what kind of uh, innovation, what kind of new technologies, or maybe beyond healthcare uh, industry to other industries to uh, to find uh, new technologies that could be could have an application in in healthcare. Yeah. Um, well, certainly we talk to many, many different specialties, specialties that are doing minimally invasive procedures today, but also where we may be able to use these minimally invasive procedures for specialties that are not using our imaging systems and Azorian and our medical devices, because over time, I think more and more surgery will become minimally invasive. And so that means going to Congresses around the world. That means going to hospitals around the world, which is also part of the most exciting part of my job, because you, you really learn a lot when you visit places like Japan and Thailand and Australia. And all too often in healthcare, it's very provincial. And those of us that train, we tend to only know what we see locally, mm -hmm. but so much innovation comes from different parts of the world and putting it together is important. But it's also not just going to Congresses around healthcare. It's also like you just alluded to Lucian, um, uh, 
other technologies that are present in our consumer world and seeing how you could reapply that in the world of healthcare. And of course, we're talking about things like artificial intelligence and telepresence and augmented reality and robotics. Uh, and, a, and so these types of tools, I think, um, largely started out in the gaming industry and the consumer world. But over time, we're going to see them, and we're already seeing them, make their way to healthcare. All right. That's great. I'm, I'm, I think uh, uh, um, Apple is going to show their uh, new uh, augmented reality or virtual reality headset uh, uh, at a conference, WWDC. I think it's uh, June uh, 5th. Uh, this uh, this year, uh, and and in a, a recent article, you you drew a vision of the the procedure room in in ten years time when you mentioned those those technologies, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, robotics, three um, D medical imaging with ultra higher resolution smart devices. So, let's start with augmented reality. Can you explain just what's the difference between AR and VR, and why does it matter in uh, image guided therapy? Yeah, so um, augmented reality um, is um, superimposing upon the real world data uh, imaging. And actually, um, you can do it with glasses, but it's not just with glasses. So actually, much of what we've been doing, we talked about some of the research I was doing 25 years ago, where we superimpose your medical imaging upon the live x-ray, CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds, on top of the live x-ray. And that's what we do at Philips, merging these multiple modalities to give live navigation, but we put it on a big screen. So that in effect is augmenting reality, adding something to reality. In fact, I'm not interested in replacing reality. I just want to add to reality. So I always want to be able to see the patient, see the image and add to it. Now, technology is being developed. And in fact, we um, worked closely with many of these companies, including uh, at the launch of HoloLens 2 with Microsoft, um, uh, concepts of being able to now add um, wearables so that I can see the real world, but superimpose the data coming out of our Azurion. And so to me, that is the holy grail for augmented reality. But it's very important for your listeners to know um, the difference between AR and VR, like you said. So VR, you're replacing the world with data, but I don't want to do that. I really want to be able to keep my eyes on the patient, my hands on the device, and still see the real world, but just add data to it. And I think technology is going to have to play catch up even over the next several years until the optimal wearable is, is ready uh, for use in the interventional suite. But it's not just about imaging. I want to be able to see the data on a virtual screen, but not just in 2D. I want to see it as a hologram because so much of our body is 3D. And today we're repurposing the 3D information on 2D screens. So it gives me a lot more information when I can see it in 3D. But it's not just about visualizing it. I also want to control the system. I want to control the Azurion. And that's really where I think our AR vision is. I want to be able to control the medical data and our system through voice commands, through eye tracking, through intuitive gestures. This way, um, it allows us potentially to be more efficient. It allows us to be uh, more precise and it allows more people to operate these very complicated systems. So at its core, AR alone is not the solution. It's embedding AR coupled with AI and putting it into the Azurion lab so that you can control all of that mountain of medical data much more intuitively. Okay, so that sounds quite a, a futuristic um, implementation of the, the, the international suit. Uh, what are the steps towards this uh, vision? What is uh, already uh, uh, possible today, available, or what you already tried at Philips with those uh, augmented reality glasses? Well, just talking about AR in general, I mean, you can think about many different applications. I just described a few looking at holograms instead of a 3D structure on a 2D screen. And those types of things we're doing already in clinical trials. You can also control the system with eye tracking and voice commands. So I don't have to take my hands off of the device and start pressing buttons or tell somebody else uh, what I think I want them to do. It almost is like it's reading your mind. If it sees me looking at an object and I say, zoom, it knows what I'm looking at and it just zooms up in front of me. Also ergonomics. Um, it's the image is right there where I need it. I don't have to crane my neck. And remember, there are multiple mm -hmm. people in these suites looking at the same image. And up till now, we've had these large 65-inch screens that we have to rotate around, and it's never in the perfect position for everybody. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of things that we're exploring today, but also just simple things, or at least sound simple, like increasing access to care. We're embedding 
telemedicine and teleultrasound uh, into our handheld ultrasound product called Lumify. So you can imagine that an obstetrician can remotely guide a caregiver, like a midwife, help them scan their patient, uh, potentially a patient in India or Africa, and an obstetrician in France or Japan or uh, in the UK can guide them through that procedure because they're able to see not only the probe, but also through cameras, what the what the caregiver is 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 imaging. And so this telepresence and remote assist is is a very big part of telehealth and AR, and that's already happening today. Yeah, I think it, it, it resonates a lot with the other um, applications, uh, other products in in surgery where they uh, they use, uh, as you say, augmented reality to to add information, like during spine surgery, and to avoid turning the the, the head to the to, to the display screen, replacing basically. It's like uh, that was a, an evolution from small nineteen inch screens to those very big large display, and now we are coming back to a. Uh, a much smaller and much uh, maybe much more ergonomic solution to display relevant information to the to the primary operator, but also to the staff that uh, I guess can have those kind of uh, glasses to get the same uh, same vision and same information either when they are in the room or when they are uh, remotely uh, uh, situated for some kind of remote case support or peer to peer support uh, during uh, during the case that's also something we've uh, we are seeing in uh, in uh, in surgery it's an interesting and, and you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence that uh, that is something that uh, i think we can we can say has been quite a, a buzzword for many years uh, there've been a, a promise or a fear of replacing radiologists for you know the diagnostics and uh, we know right now that it's not going to happen at least not not right now uh, we need someone to uh, review the images with the help of AI, but uh, it will not replace uh, the, completely the, the radiologist. So how do you see the role of artificial intelligence in, in the specific field of uh, image-guided uh, therapy? Um, well, I think you hit the nail on the head, Lucian. It um, has been a bit of a buzzword, and I think that's a double-edged sword because I think expectations have been heavily raised for AI over the past two decades. And at least... Um, over the past decade, I think a lot of physicians um, have found that um, it was overpromised, overhyped. And I think we need to recalibrate what our expectations are of AI. And at least my expectation of AI is, first of all, I don't even call it really artificial intelligence. I think it's assisted intelligence. It's going to be an assistant for me. It's going to be assistant for physicians to make better use of that mountains of medical information. Like you said, um, at least not in my lifetime, I'm not anticipating a time where Robots are running around with stethoscopes around their neck taking care of me and you. I don't think AIs will replace physicians, but I do think that AI as a tool will replace physicians uh, that use it, uh, that don't use it. So uh, physicians that use AI will replace those that don't use it. And by the way, I think that's true in many um, uh, fields, not just medicine, but I think in general, I think AI is going to be used as a tool to help more people do their jobs better. So how is it being used today? Well, it's already being used today and making a big difference in how care is being delivered. And I do think it's going to be more deeply integrated in healthcare over time. So for instance, take a look at CAT scans. Let's talk about stroke. Stroke um, is one of the leading causes of disability and death in the world. You're young, I'm young, your audience is largely young. If you're over the age of 25, keep listening because one in four of us will suffer a stroke at some point in our life. That's tremendous. That's Yeah, that's huge. Huge. And the problem today is very few of the patients that are suffering stroke are being treated appropriately. You know, time is brain. Seconds count. You lose 2 million neurons every minute a stroke is in progress. But if we can get you to the interventional suite, to our Azorion, and to an interventional neuroradiologist or neurosurgeon or an image-guided therapist, they can navigate a tiny catheter to the brain, to your middle cerebral artery, and take out that little tiny clot and, and potentially reverse that stroke if it's done early enough. But that's the key to get it done early enough. And so right now we have solutions where we are speeding up that time to brain so that patients don't have to go, for, for instance, um, to a CAT scan and then wait for that CAT scan to read, a, radi a radiologist to read the image and then call all of the, the team that needs to transport that patient to the stroke center. We can shave off lots of those steps using AI. So for instance, a, a CT scanner can automatically scan through that CT as the patient is being imaged for stroke. And it, it's sort of an early warning system. If, if it thinks that there's a clot that's amenable to thrombectomy, it'll automatically activate the all of the people that need to 
um, uh, uh, respond. So now you're shaving off time. Um, so that's one example of how AI is making a difference. Speeding up imaging, uh, MRIs, smart speed, which is a technology built into our MRI scanners. We now can scan patients three times faster with 65% more resolution using AI. So if you've ever had an MRI, you know how sometimes uncomfortable it is to sit there in that scanner. You can mm -hmm. do it three times faster using AI. Or with cardiac disease, it used to be if you go to the hospital, and it still is, a nurse would have to come and check on you every 30 minutes, checking your vital signs, checking your heart rate and your blood pressure and so on. But now AI is being embedded into our patient monitors, and even wearable biosensors can monitor your vital signs, not once or twice an hour, but once or twice or 10 times a second. And so it can crunch all of that data and then predict who's at risk for a cardiac arrest before you have that cardiac arrest. And in fact, one hospital in the UK was able to reduce cardiac arrest by almost 70% uh, uh, using this technology. So the trick for AI, I think, is making use of that mountains of data and intervene, helping us intervene before something goes wrong rather than for waiting for it to happen. Okay, so yeah, I understand that uh, AI uh, has like um, a whole lot of uh, potential applications uh, as long as there is uh, a lot of data that needs to be processed and uh, the, where time is uh, critical to get a, to get an answer or to get a, some some uh, insight on uh, what 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 is uh, giving this uh, this uh, this data. How do you did, did you face um, challenges in validating uh, artificial intelligence algorithm in in the examples that uh, you were citing or uh, how, how how can the uh, company like Philips implement AI into a, a medical product that is uh, then uh, approved by the uh, regulatory uh, bodies? Well, I think that's the trick, and 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 it's it's not just industry. Like I said at the top, it, it collaboration is what it takes for innovation not just collaboration between leading hospitals in the world and leading industry health tech companies like Philips. That's not enough. You need to have collaboration between patients, between physicians, between hospitals, between regulatory authorities, payers, and governments because uh, and industry. Because especially with AI, it's so um, local. There's different rules and regulations depending on where you're at. And we're already seeing, and we know very well, that you can't train your, your models on heart disease that only um, is uh, 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 heart, on models, just say, for instance, from the US or mm -hmm. Japan. Patients are very different on the inside, and disease is very different, and some patients have more calcified vessels than others. And there are differences in patients, not on the outside, but also on the inside. And so you have to be very cautious on how you train these models. I don't. I can't say that we have the answer, but I do think that it's going to require a lot of close cooperation, and and even regulatory authorities are are are, are struggling with how do we um, move forward in a uh, a compliant um, and 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 good way with technologies like AI. If okay. you figure out the answer, let me know. Yeah, no, I think everybody is uh, struggling with this question, so uh, it's uh, it's it's a matter of time. And it's a matter of uh, collaboration and and doing a, a step by step approach uh, to uh, to introduce this kind of uh, new technologies, new algorithm in uh, in uh, clinical practice. But yeah, I emphasize the fact that uh, uh, you know the the bias or the representativity of the data is uh, is very critical. And uh, what what has not been the same for a, a medical device in validation in general is really important for for AI to have the data that is uh, representative of all the markets that are targeted by the by the by the solution. That so that means. Uh, and, and, and you know, it's um, a good point because um, I think that people in the consumer world don't recognize how complicated the health technology world is, and for good reason. We have to be first time right all the time. And so even when we have alliances and partnerships and dialogues with leading technology companies in the world, um, they, I don't think they appreciate the requirement to be, to be perfect in healthcare because we don't have the, the, uh, the luxury of um, mm -hmm. uh, having a mistake being made with any of these technologies, whether it's AI or robotics or AR uh, or automation. Uh, and so um, just think about your, your car or your uh, cell phone. We've had voice commands and voice control for two decades now. But how often when you say a command, is it giving you, A, the answer that you expect, or even a, hearing you correctly? 
you can't uh, have those kind of errors happen. Yeah, it's when terrible. You're to it's fix terrible. A valve in the heart or an aneurysm, and that's why it takes us so long in healthcare to to get these products out. Sometimes people say, "I've had all these technologies on my phone and my car for decades. How come you guys can't just put it into your interventional suite or on your medical device?" And, and that's the reason. We need to be perfect, but we are poised over the next decade, I think, um, to have um, all of these technologies come together. And, and this next decade is going to be super exciting. All right, thanks. So you you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned I, I agree on the you know the the voice command. Uh, sometimes I'm uh, I'm traveling by car and I ask uh, the GPS to go somewhere and and it takes me three times to to get the not even the right answer. So I just type the address uh, with with my finger. So um, you mentioned uh, robotics a couple of time. Um, uh, so that there have, there have been robotics in surgery, general surgery, urology, gynecology, and then neurosurgery, orthopedics for quite some time now. We've seen the introduction of robotics in um, endovascular and percutaneous uh, space uh, in image-guided uh, therapy. Uh, I'm curious to know what's your uh, vision and the vision of Philips on uh, robotics because the, the, there is some uh, struggle on, on the adoption of this kind of technology right now. And uh, I, I would like to have your uh, your take on uh, robotics. I think there's a struggle in adoption of a lot of technologies. Um, and it, maybe that goes back to my um, um, mentorship with Dr. Cope and the business of not just throwing technology for technology's sake, but really trying to address an unmet need. So before we jump into robotics, maybe it's worthwhile to say, what are we trying to solve for? Why is image guided therapy even important? It's not just about an AR device or a robotics device or automation or what are we trying to solve for? And the truth is, is that patients are getting older. They're getting sicker. Uh, disease is much more complex. On top of that, we have staff shortages around the world. Every day you pick up a newspaper and you see a headline, no matter what continent you live on, where nurses are quitting, physicians are quitting, staff, uh, hospitals are busting at the seams. Um, and, and on top of that, we also have less healthcare funds. Funds are shrinking no matter where you are in the world. So we have this perfect storm where we have more complex disease, we have not enough people to take care of you, and we have less money to take care of you. That, in a nutshell to me, is the problem. But I do think that we can use technology to increase efficiency. I think innovations like telehealth, AR, AI, robotics and automation, as you just described, these are the type of things that are going to help us revolutionize care because they're going to help seasoned physicians do even more, more efficiently, take care of more patients maybe even remotely, and they're going to drive down the cost of care. But it also requires us then to develop the evidence, not just the clinical evidence, proving that these technologies improve your outcomes. That's not enough anymore. We also have to develop, and we are developing the evidence to show that our technologies are also driving down the cost of care. Because when half of the world doesn't isn't able to access care, um, it doesn't matter if you have a very expensive, technologically savvy product. If they can't pay for it, or if we can't prove that it makes a difference for overall societal costs, it's going to be left unused. And you can't help the, the two and a half billion patients a year that we hope to improve by uh, 2030. So that's why we do what we do in image guided therapy, by coupling our imaging to our devices. And then when you talk about robotics, um, maybe before I answer, maybe I'll, since you have a lengthy history in robotics, I'll ask you that same question. What is your vision of how robotics can improve care and uh, improve outcomes, maybe reduce costs, and also improve the patient and staff satisfaction. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think it, it, there is no single answer. Uh, uh, each um, each specialty, each indication has a, diff a bit different uh, unmet needs and uh, and challenge to be solved. And 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 some can be solved by robotics. Some can be solved by uh, navigation or uh, other uh, technologies. Uh, I think in many cases, what we've seen is that. Uh, Robotics enables to uh, make complex cases easy uh, for a physician, so that it, they, it enables, like to, like the Da Vinci enabled to transition from open surgery to um, laparoscopic surgery. Uh, in um, in uh, neurosurgery, uh, epilepsy uh, surgery, it enables in the U.S. to uh, move from big craniotomy procedures to. Uh, uh, keyhole neurosurgery, implantation of depth electrodes. So there are many uh, examples like that where, uh, with the also with the the power of uh, pre-surgical planning or intervention planning, you have uh, the data, and then robotics enables to execute the plan in a way that it's uh, 
it's, it makes the life easier for a physician when it's uh, quite complex when uh, done uh, free. And that's, uh, that's what I, uh, I've seen, what I believe uh, can be the, the benefit of uh, robotics. I tend to agree with you. I think that um, um, robotics is going to help augment physicians. It's going to help us be more accurate, make us more precise, maybe help us treat more complex tumors or more complex spine uh, disease or more complex vascular or neurovascular disease. I think it's going to lower the learning curve for these complex procedures so that more people can um, be uplifted with their skill sets uh, uh, to do these complex procedures. But it's also going to give superhuman abilities to very skilled individuals. Uh, and I also can foresee a future where it's going to help with improving access to care by unlocking remote procedures in locations where medical specialists are scarce. But I think it's a mistake to think it's only going to be one of those things. The analogy I like to use is maybe um, with the car industry. For me, at least, I think um, robotics, and I like to call about, I, I like to refer to it as robotics and procedural automation because it's not just the robot. It has to be a robot coupled with AI and automation. That's what we want. I don't want a remote control car. What I want is a self-driving car. I want a system that doesn't replace me, but that can maybe um, assist me to take some of the monotonous tasks off my plate um, so that I can maybe do procedures with less staff, or I can do it faster, or my junior colleague could do it just as fast as me. Or as I said before, give me superhuman ability so I can do it even better. To me, that's my vision for robotics. And it's not going to be just robotics. I think um, we're seeing all of these technologies come together. So it's, it's going to be image-guided therapy, AI, AR, robotics and automation, telehealth. These technologies, which are just now starting to mature, they're all going to be coming together into a single procedural room, and we're going to see them unleashed over the next decade. Yeah, I agree, and and uh, I think one of the challenges that uh, we do have in the in the industry is to is to make those technologies uh, interoperable because uh, that's uh, I mean the physician doesn't want to have one user interface for this AI, one user interface or one AR glasses for this indication, then another robot for this one, and and, and the challenge will have to some kind of make uh, 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 the, the way so that these kind of uh, technologies are seamlessly integrated uh, into a, a, a single product or a single suite of, um, of uh, solutions. Because even with your robotic, you're the end user, the physician and the nurses and the technologists, they're using a device, an endovascular device. They're using an x-ray system or an imaging modality. They're using an assisting tool like a robot or an AI solution but they have to put it all together. And just like when you buy a car, I'm not particularly interested in going to a car dealership where I have to buy the windshield wipers from one company and the brakes from another company and the accelerator from a third company and a radio from a fourth company and then having four different interfaces to make it all work together. And that's what we're doing in image guided therapy at Philips. We're coupling our and other interventional endovascular devices into our uh, leading interventional systems putting it together so that you have a harmonized um, uh, interface, but also so that you can improve efficiency, improve outcomes, reduce cost. And, and it's that's how you drive adoption in, in innovating the procedure. And so that's that's exactly what we're doing with many of our endovascular devices that we build. And, and, and talking about uh, endovascular devices, uh, Philips has, a, has a, a strategy that is maybe a bit different from uh, other uh, medical imaging players to... Uh, to uh, Philips built a, a therapy devices business through acquisition first and now through uh, probably in-house uh, development. Uh, can you explain why uh, Philips Medical Imaging Company uh, should provide uh, uh, devices, endovascular devices, and how you differentiate from uh, device manufacturers? Yeah, why? Because it improves outcomes and it reduces cost. Remember the unmet need. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a technology called IFR. Um, it's, um, it's physiology. It's a, a wire-based technology that we put into coronary arteries to see what the flow is. Um, because traditionally, when people have PCI procedures, coronary artery procedures, you would do an angiogram, a two-dimensional angiogram. Yep. And if you saw narrowing, you would fix it. But data now shows that it's not just enough to see what it looks like. You also have to see what it's doing inside. And so we have technology that we've created, IFR, where we co-register that physiology data, the flow data with that wire, on top of the angio. 
And why do why do customers want this? Why do physicians want this? It's because it's data has shows us, shown that it uncovers hidden lesions. Uh, one in four patients leave a cath lab with a stenosis still in place because it just wasn't seen on the regular old angiogram. So by adding the IFR, large data and large studies have shown that we're improving outcomes, reducing bad outcomes by almost 70% at one year. So this is why we want this to happen. But then it's not just about creating the technology. We also have to prove that it's cost efficient. And so um, you can look at, for instance, um, uh, uh, something that we just announced two weeks ago at the Euro PCR meeting. We have a solution called Dynamic Coronary uh, Roadmap. It's it's using motion compensated two dimensional imaging on top of a beating heart. For, again, for the same PCI procedure, we're overlaying an angiogram like a human GPS on the heart. And what we found is, is that it's reducing contrast by almost thirty percent. So now you're reducing the contrast, which is very important because contrast can result in kidney injury, mm -hmm. uh, especially in patients that have compromised kidneys and these sick patients. And it means more cost of care. So so that's reducing cost. Uh, but these expensive tools have to also make sense for the C-suite, the people that have to buy your robots and our imaging systems and our endovascular devices. And so going back to the stroke story, we already know that if you bring a patient into our interventional suite and do the CAT scan using our cone beam CT, where we can do a 3D model of your brain without a CAT scanner and see the brain, we can, using this direct angio suite approach, diagnose your stroke even faster, making your, your outcomes even greater Data has shown that when we do this thrombectomy procedure to reverse the stroke. But at what cost? Well, we finally have that answer. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, in the Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery, uh, researchers found that every single patient that has this direct angio suite approach using our Azurion, this type of imaging, saves the C suite, saves the hospital about 3,000 US dollars, even more than that, per patient. And that's because the patient is discharged from the hospital earlier. They have less complications. They're less time in the intensive care unit. So now we're putting not just a clinical outcomes number on it, but we're also putting a dollar or euro out, uh, number on it, making it making the, 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 the argument that there's a health economics reason to have it. This is why we want to integrate our imaging to our devices. It's not just for technology. Again, it's about reducing the cost, and it's about improving outcomes and also improving patient and staff satisfaction. All right. So uh, I, th I think the, to summarize what, what we've discussed uh, so far, uh, one of the key components is the integration of all these technologies. So you have the international imaging system that can provide either 2D or 3D images. Uh, you have AI that can uh, do faster reconstruction, faster imaging, uh, stuff like that. You have augmented reality that can uh, add another layer of data on these images and help uh, control those uh, uh, equipment, medical imaging uh, equipment, uh, robotics that, that could uh, help you uh, do more complex procedures or uh, uh, do more procedure, do some procedure faster or with less people. And uh, and, and, and then the, the, the smart devices that when they are integrated with this um, imaging uh, equipment can improve the the, the patient outcomes and, and you stress the fact that uh, it has to be clinically proven and also uh, establish uh, the medical um, uh, economical uh, benefit uh, of uh, this kind of uh, of uh, solution. So that's a uh, that's a uh, I'm really uh, passionate about this uh, this field, image guided therapy. That is uh, not that well known in um, in the in the medtech uh, industry but uh, there are a lot of different devices a lot of different technologies and a lot of challenges in various uh, specialties clinical segments so you mentioned uh, uh, cardiology you mentioned um, neurovascular vascular oncology there are a lot of uh, segments that can uh, benefit from uh, from this um, technology and this way of uh, of uh, doing a procedure so my my last question uh, would be um, You've got a very exciting job, very exciting uh, position at uh, at uh, Philips, uh, forcing the future of image guided therapy. But if you weren't an uh, international radiologist and if you weren't CMO of um, of uh, Philips, money was not a concern. What would you do today? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Well, uh, I suppose I would love to be. I, I love. Excellent restaurants and traveling around the world lets me experience some of them. So I suppose I could be a restaurant critic. Uh, I like to travel. Uh, I, I, when I was a child, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, 
of course, you know, uh, everybody wants to be a rock star. Uh, the problem is, is that I can't really cook. I can't fly mm-hmm. a plane. I, uh, I can't sing. I can't play an instrument uh, beyond the MP3 player. So I don't think any of those three things really would work for me. So I guess for now, I'm going to have to stick to medicine. <laughs> All right. Good answer. And what's your, what's your favorite uh, cuisine? Uh, the var- Much like doing procedures, it's the variety. That's the spice yeah. of life. And so I don't have a favorite. Uh, it's it's Every city I go to, uh, it's it's that variety that gets me most excited about about the cuisine. Okay, great message. Thank you, thank you very much. I want to be uh, mindful of uh, your time, Dr. Gupta. So uh, thank you very much for uh, being uh, on the show and sharing your uh, vision about uh, image-guided uh, therapy, the future of uh, those technologies for the international suit, but also the hybrid operating room and uh, and uh, the uh, operating room. Uh, hang on a minute, we'll, uh, we'll chat offline. Uh, thank you uh, all very much for listening to the Less Invasive podcast, your source for minimally invasive uh, surgery, robotics, and assistive technologies in the OR and radiology environment. Thank you, Lucian.